Hello and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid in your everyday life. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson. The first person I approached to have on this show before the show had even started was James Fallows. James Fallows is a hero of mine. He is someone who I spent years thinking about his ideas, formulating what became everyday anarchism in a way that was deeply influenced by his work. James did agree to come on the show right away. We weren't able to get it scheduled until now. So here it is. Please enjoy this interview. It is about the dysfunction of America as a country right now and also how amazing America works as a country, as long as you look at it the right way. I'm joined today with uh, James Fallows. I don't know where to begin with his resume, so maybe I'll just skip the resume and say that James is one of the most interesting thinkers today for me about the American political system, but much more interestingly about the way that American democracy works in smaller towns and in local communities outside, or in some cases, I would say even in uh, opposition to the bigger political system in America. So uh, James, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Um, Graham, thank you very much. You may call me uh, Jim, as all of my immediate force field do, and I appreciate uh, being able to talk with you about this convergence of what democracy and anarchism and organization and all the rest mean, mean for the U.S. and the world now. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, I guess I'll start by saying um, I, I listened to your interview with Derek Thompson, where you ran through all of the problems facing us as a democracy at the national level. People uh, cannot vote. Our institutions are not functioning. The political system is not working and it's growing less democratic. And I want to start by saying I completely agree with you about all of those things you raised. And listeners, you can, you can check out that um, interview. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But my desire, even as it's, I think, important for people to people in DC to work to fix the system, I'm much more interested in the way that that system is in some fundamental way not democratic, that democracy, the great American tradition of democracy, going back to Tocqueville and Whitman, is about communities solving problems together. And that's just not something that Washington DC can do, or rather maybe it can, but not for, not for Boise, Idaho. So, so thanks for that opening and the mention to the interview with my friend and the former Atlantic colleague, um, Derek Thompson. And, and let me make, if I could, um, three brief points coming off that interview. One is a media point. It was fascinating to me that the, I, I think Derek has a, a wide um, audience in political terms. And the reaction I got from people who disagreed with what I was presenting as a factual narrative about the evolution of the filibuster and the evolution of the Supreme Court was, oh, this is so biased. If you talk about what one party has done objectively, then it's, uh, they don't disagree with you on the substance, say, but oh, it is biased. Talk about one party and, and, and not the other. That was a reminder of the many years I spent as a commentator on NPR, or that was sort of the traffic you would get from NPR. This is something to do. A second point about American national level uh, democracy is, I've lived, as you know, for a long time outside the US in China and Japan and Southeast Asia and Europe, et cetera. And one of the conclusions I drew from that time is only a country as blessed in countless ways as the US could have made it this far with the kind of national governance we have, which is, I think, structurally flawed for, from the beginning, as we can discuss, discuss. And then I guess the third point is one that's in alliance with you that the real strength of the U.S. is the part of the national saga of this moment we very rarely hear covered in the national media, which is the way, ways there are resilience and adjustment and compromise and practical mindedness at the local person to person level. 
despite all the problems that emerge there, despite inequalities and et cetera, et cetera, there is a kind of progressivism in this small p sense that happens at local level America that people have become very uh, pessimistic about at the national level. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And if there was ever a sense, I'm skeptical of this, but there are people who talk about the idea that the U.S. Senate used to be kind of a a town hall, a place where this sort of compromise could be worked out face to face. And if that ever happened, we're so far be, beyond that point right now that that I, for one, uh, am growing. I mean, I'm growing despondent about um, the possibility of fixing our our national system, or rather, I don't think it can be fixed unless we turn away from it to to a certain extent and work on the parts of America that work. The other thing I guess I'll say briefly is I just want to make clear, well, besides the fact that people who heard your history of the filibuster and thought it was just factually incorrect, that is wrong. My, my PhD is in American culture. Your your history is correct. Here I am, expert. You, you are right. Those people are wrong. Um, but the other thing is, I want people to understand, uh, this is a point that David Graeber makes a lot, the U.S. government was not designed to be a democracy. And when you find people like Madison and Hamilton, they, they actually write, we do not want a democracy. In fact, for them, as for me, democracy and anarchy mean more or less the same thing. And they were trying to prevent, quote, democracy or, quote, anarchy from breaking out. And that's why it raises my hackles when people say, oh, Trump might destroy our democracy. I laugh because I don't think our democracy has really started yet. It, it, um, a- excellent point. And I will say, and I don't know if this is a, a field in which you, the PhD expert, and I, the reporter, uh, <laughs> see things similarly <laughs> or, or differently, but I think that Madison, Hamilton, Jay, et cetera, were trying to create a government that was functional mm-hmm. in contrast to the Articles of Fe- Confederation. And one of my themes, as you know, is the Senate has now sort of grown into this grotesque aberration that makes governing and governance dysfunctional at the national level, except in in extreme cases, which I think is not what Madison, Hamilton, et cetera, had in mind. But you're right. It was not a small D uh, democracy uh, they had in mind, although they it was again, I'm curious whether you agree with this. One of my contentions is that if the compromises that went into the Constitution uh, you know, we know they were crafted when the disproportion between big states and small states was 10 to 1 in population, Virginia to Delaware. Now it's 70 to 1. My my contention is that Hamilton, Madison, et cetera, would not have agreed on the current Senate if it were a 70 to 1 disproportion in those days. Um, uh, so, Professor, agree or disagree? <laughs> yes, that, that is that is absolutely that is absolutely right. There's no way that Hamilton or Madison would have agreed to that. I guess the other point I have to make is if you look at Jefferson's writing, you can see a belief in democracy or anarchism or whatever you would like to call it in his writing. But I believe Hamilton was absolutely right. Even if Jefferson believed that in some way, if this functional central government had not been created, what you would have gotten was a bunch of local oligarchies. And so there, it was not a choice, as much as I would like it to be, between a vision of Jeffersonian democracy versus a vision of Hamiltonian technocratic top-down government. It was a choice between Hamiltonian technocratic top-down government with some Democratic and Republican features versus a sort of pure rule by the wealthiest individuals of each state. And in that respect, uh, I, I like the Constitution, as opposed to the Articles of Confederacy, because it seems like grassroots democracy was was never on the table. Even if you can find Jefferson advocating for grassroots democracy, this was a plantation owner and slaveholder. He, the man, did not live grassroots democracy in any way. Um, yes, um, well put, and with with. With an academic authority, so I, I will say, and, and, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim. This is this is this is what no, I do. I, I, no, I mean that in a good way. And I think you know the best part of the troubled, long, contentious history of our country is is when there's been a 
uh, coexistence of a national government attending to big issues in a way that only a national government can, for example, the New Deal, or for example, the national interstate highway system under Eisenhower, et cetera, um, doing those things and allowing local level and regional level innovation to, to evolve and flourish underneath that kind of protective um, armor with all the things that were wrong in national governance, especially on, uh, you know, rights for, for black people, you know, that, that is, you know, items number one through 10 and, and, and most of the lists. So I think the, um, the, we still can use a national government that can do big national things, but part of the mission that I've been involved in and Deb has been involved in, as you know, is trying to say the, struggles the national government are not the only story in the U.S. right now, even though you would think that if you were yes. looking at the, the national media. So just having a more three-dimensional portrayal of all the contradictory um, uh, channels in the American saga now, that's part of what we've been trying to do. Yeah, excellent. I also want to point out that in, in the 20th century, and this is, I think, uniquely American, having spoken to advocates for democracy and, and anarchism around the world, the US government, the federal government in the mid century did make enormous strides um, on the, the lives of black people and the lives of women and various other oppressed groups. And I believe that legacy remains um, in terms of those of us on the left like to think of the Supreme Court or federal bureaucracies as things that can intervene and give us things like abortion rights, voting rights, gay marriage, that sort of thing. But in the long sweep of history, federal bureaucracies in the Supreme Court have had an oppressive backwards force. And that's why I'm trying to get us moving away from fighting, uh, fighting for, to take those institutions back, those institutions which can so easily be corrupted and returning the federal government, precisely as you say to this, it can, it can set the table, it can weave some things together, and then the states really could become laboratories of democracy. I understand the fear that if you remove the federal government from Mississippi or Alabama, you're not going to get a laboratory of democracy, you're going to get oppression. I just refuse to believe that the federal government anytime soon is going to fix that in any way. Uh, it, that is a, a, a profound and provocative point that I think is in a way an organizing principle of what Americans hope for the next two years, the next 10 years, the, the next 50 years. I think it is important to, to bear in mind, as, as you emphasize, the, the misleading recent history, misleading modern, by which I mean mid 20th century onward history of the Supreme Court, that I was, you know, I'm of the dreaded boomer era. So when I was a little kid in Southern California in the 1950s and early 1960s, the Supreme Court was um, uh, issuing its Brown v. Board of Education rulings. And then it was the national government enforcing desegregation orders in Arkansas and Alabama and other places. And there was the idea that on the big bets in American history, the national government under Dwight Eisenhower and then under John Kennedy and the Supreme Court under Earl Warren would come down on the arc of history <laughs> bending toward justice <laughs> side. As you know, that's not mainly the history of the Supreme Court. It's the history arguably from, let's say, 50 or 60 years uh, under, under Earl Warren and ironically um, Warren Burger, And that, that the Supreme Court is returning to its historic norm now, which is an instrument of reaction and an instrument of, of, of privilege. I think the um, I think modern history may have may, an axis might have been on whatever the day was in December of 2000 with uh, Bush v. Gore and then followed by um, Citizens United and then or whatever the sequence was of Shelby <laughs> County and then Citizens mm -hmm. United. Those were the three big rulings that may have returned the Supreme Court to its Lochner era of sort of the, the pre-New Deal era and not all the way back to Dred Scott, but just a sense of the Supreme Court is a reactionary element in American life and not the vessel of um, progressive thoughts. And that may be clarifying in where people concentrate their efforts. I believe the Senate also has historically been a, a reactionary um, in, institution. And those at this stage in our current government, I would argue that perhaps those two are the most 
the the two most powerful institutions. Despite the imperial presidency we have built lately, the presidents have not wielded anywhere near as much power. Um, I, I would agree with that. And again, you can <laughs> can give me the scholar's blessing for this. It would seem to me that that back at the start there was this um, isn't it pretty to think so idea that the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and, jud and judicial would have some kind of balance against each other. And now there is essentially no institutional pride. It's a three different branches of the main partisan struggle of uh, Republican versus Democratic. And so you have the the defects of parliamentary government, which is you know complete sort of partisan alignment without the virtue of parliamentary government of being able to get things done. And so I, I think that is something that has um, happened. And this, um, yes, the, the Senate, we can, I have a theory on Senate and golden ageism of the Senate. Would you like to hear that? <laughs> um, yeah, yes, go, go ahead. <laughs> so the theory would be that there was a time, maybe only late 60s, early 70s, early 80s, when there was still enough of a Republican Northern and Midwestern mm. existence of the so-called Rockefeller Republicans, John Heinz Republicans, Lowell Weicker Republicans, who were, um, and maybe first George Bush Republicans, who thought of themselves as having some kind of environmentally progressive um, stance, and they would vote for the Voting Rights Act, they would vote for the EPA, et cetera. Et cetera. And so the Senate, for a the same kind of false memory of the mid-century Supreme Court is a false memory of the Senate uh, for maybe a couple decade period in the late 20th century. And it's now returning to its roots as well, I contend. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, so you have my you have my scholarly blessing, although it doesn't <laughs> sound to me like you need it. I will say um, from a scholarly point, the only thing I would want to add is they they were meant to balance each other, and you're absolutely right. So the reason why. Madison stated, precisely as you say, that each senator would feel great pride in their, or rather his, status as a senator and in the Senate as an institution. And so the Senate would never kowtow to a president the way the Senate kowtowed to um, Trump. So you're absolutely right. They are behaving in a parliamentary way in which Trump is the prime minister, in which they uh, completely support every decision his government makes in a system that was precisely designed not to be like that. The last thing I just need to correct real quick, not, not correct something you said, but correct a common misconception that Americans think. Yes, there are three branches of government and they are meant to have checks and balances. But the thing that every second grader is taught that they are meant to be co-equal is not true. The Supreme Court was designed to have almost no power. And in a future episode, I will talk about how the Supreme Court gained this power. It's a commonly told, but also I think commonly mistold story. Congress was supposed to have most of the power and the Senate. The reason why the Senate gets to weigh in on cabinet and uh, Supreme Court justices and all that is because coming off what, what they thought was the oppression less by the king, but more by the king's ministers. The constitution was written such that the legislative power of the Senate would actually get into, infiltrate the executive power. It was not meant, the presidency was not meant to be, or rather the presidency was its own institution. And then the Senate was supposed to be sort of 70% legislative, 30% executive. And that aspect has been has been forgotten. Um, people do not know why the Supreme Court justices have to be approved by the Senate. Madison wanted the Senate to serve as a secondary executive body, and it it no longer does. It's a parliamentary body now with executive uh, tasks and duties, which is a, as you say, a, it doesn't work. That is really interesting. I will look forward to hearing that episode too, because this is um, new terrain to me. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'm going to give you one other anecdotal note on the evolving role, role of both the Congress and the Senate and the false memory. The very first article I ever did for a national publication was for Esquire magazine when I just got out of graduate school. And uh, in 1974, 
and it was about a Republican member of the House Judiciary Committee. This was Charles Wiggins, a very conservative uh, congressman from uh, from Los Angeles. And I followed him for four or five months during his deliberations over the Nixon impeachment. And the point was, people like Charles Wiggins finally turned on mm-hmm. Richard Nixon. And Wiggins finally went to the White House with this group with Barry Goldwater and others and said, you have to leave. It's over after the Nixon tapes. It's the absence of those people or their distillation to the persons of mainly perhaps Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger that, that is the change in the Republican Party. Because uh, Wiggins brought many Republicans with him. Cheney brought no Republicans with her. And that, that is the diff- a difference in where we are now. Okay, um, excellent. That, that 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 that's an important story to tell. That 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 is the difference between Nixon and Trump mm-hmm. was that Republicans changed their mind. Okay, uh, is it all right if we stop talking about our massively dysfunctional <laughs> federal government? I guess this is the point where I note that you did in fact um, serve in a, in, in a presidential administration. It was a while ago now, Jim. So maybe not everyone knows that, but uh, <laughs> Jim did work in the Carter administration. Um, Jimmy well, Carter was once a president of the United States. Before yes, exactly. he was the there, president. In, <laughs> yes, in the in the 1970s, there was a president named Jimmy Carter. Um, he he doesn't just build houses and fight parasites. He was, in fact, a political figure. For those of you um, who have no memory of this, okay. And, um, and so let's talk about uh, your project, our towns. I mean, I have been following along, going back, I don't know, I guess about 10 years in the Atlantic. You and Deb traveling to these places around the country, including places I know very well, like Greenville, South Carolina, and, and finding the things that, that work. American democracy works, and it shouldn't surprise us that these institutions, the Senate and the Supreme Court, are failing democracy because they were, in fact, created to be un, undemocratic. So I, I've really appreciated your attention and our correspondence over the years, as Deb and I have been doing the, these reports. And I'll give the the very brief uh, background. So, um, as I mentioned, we lived around the uh, the world. We have been living in China for four years and doing reporting from uh, essentially 06 to, to 11, and then mainly tried to be on the road in China and saying how different things look when you're in Qinghai or someplace from the way they look in Shanghai or, or Beijing. Mm-hmm. So we thought when we came back to the U.S., it was time to apply that perspective too. once we had sort of regained our footing in 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 our house in D.C. We've lived off and on over the decades since the, the Carter years and say, what is it like outside the media centers in places that you normally never see covered unless there's a shooting or a drought or the Iowa caucuses or whatever? And if you don't ask people about national politics when you get there, but you ask them, What's going well here? What's going poorly? What are the young people doing, et cetera, et cetera? And it ended up being so fascinating to us that what we planned as a sort of one summer project in 2013 ended up spending most most of the next four years. We wrote a book. We made a wonderful HBO documentary, which I can say because the filmmakers made it wonderful. (laughs) It's on HBO Max called Our Towns, and it's streaming on HBO Max. I'm I'm going to break in here, Jim, and say it is it is a fabulous documentary. Um, I I watched it. I rewatched it with uh, my mom, who hadn't seen it before before this interview, and then and my mom was is now just overjoyed that I'm speaking to you. She was like, "Wow, these people seem so wonderful." So uh, it really it really is a wonderful documentary. Well, give her um, my thanks and Deb's thanks and the thanks of uh, Steve Asher and Jeannie Jordan, the genius filmmakers who who made this, which makes you, among other things, appreciate how beautiful this country is Mm -hmm. in in all of its uh, different different extent. And the the news to us, both civic and journalistic, the journalistic news is how how tragic it is that the only lens most journalists apply to most of the country is what do you think about Joe Manchin? What do you think about, you know, (laughs) Kamala Harris? What do you think about the approval ratings as opposed to the richness of your life? And the the sort of civic dimension is, again, this other sort of dark matter side of American (laughs) existence (laughs) that is never reported on and is the in contention with all the things that are 
uh, that are so familiar and so uh, distressing at the moment. So that is the, the theme, the part of the American life we wanted to try to show to people. Yeah, well, as far as I'm concerned, you have uh, you have achieved it. And then to follow up, this this goes back to this idea of anarchism. I saw someone uh, blurbing on that film calling it um, one of the most subversive films uh, <laughs> made recently. And that that comment would make no sense to someone who is not an observer of American political discourse. What could be subversive about Americans in their communities coming together to, to make sure that things work? But it's subversive because there is a narrative that things do not work. Everything is falling apart. And if you look for salvation, it must come through asking people about Joe Manchin. And uh, this, this very non-subversive idea that people in communities can work together to make the world a better place has in this world upside down sort of way become this cr crazy and outlandish theory. Hey, what if people in communities just, you know, uh, worked together and found compromises and did good stuff together? I'm like, what are you, are you insane? This is, this is a country, <laughs> the only way to fix something is to primary the uh, centermost member of your party and replace them with a further left or right member of the party. That's the American way. That, that's what we've reached. I, I'm glad you mentioned that line. It was in a our favorite review of the film by Anne Hornaday in the Washington Post, where I think her closing line was, you know, in its own quiet way, this may be the most subversive movie in circulation right now or something <laughs> for just the reasons you were saying. And, and we were particularly, there were two reasons, there were many reasons we were pleased by that. Among them, it was in the same publication where our least favorite view of the book had come out <laughs> by somebody saying, oh, well, this is just cherry picking, looking for positive news, and we know how dark things are. And and we know how dark things are. We don't know the other part of, of the, the existence. And so, so sub, subversiveness of the idea that it's all happening um, in these, you know, hallway reports from Congress that is part of the news, but not the entirety of the news. And so recognizing this other part of our national heritage, our national possibility, and, and every individual's life possibility was part of what we wanted to, to do. And, and again, why uh, our own, why we embrace the, uh, the everyday anarchism label. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the great topics of this um, podcast is the way that life opportunities are being withheld from most people. This meritocratic system that is a, a, a race to the top of these prestige pyramids at, at universities, they, they would make you believe that the, that, that the people that are featured in your work simply do not matter. Or if they did matter, they would have found a way to Harvard and then to a Fortune 500 company or to working uh, on Capitol Hill. And the people left behind are the ones that, that do not matter. And, and this is a deeply, I would say, at, at the risk of imbuing, at the risk of using an adjective that I try to never use. This is a deeply un-American idea that the people <laughs> that the people uh, who make up the majority of this country in the communities that produce everything of value in this country, that their lives don't matter. Insofar as uh, America means something good for me, something drawn from people like Tocqueville and Crevacour and J Jefferson in his writings, if not in his life, it is the idea that the communities of America are capable of amazing resilience, of amazing community, and of amazing accomplishment. And the idea that that would be considered subversive suggests to me, again, that the American experiment has gotten turned upside down. Yes. And, and so let me just, if I could, in a scattershot reply on different fronts, um, long ago, back in the late 1980s, I wrote a book on exactly this theme, sort of a precursor of our talk today and, and the recent work that Deb and I had, have done. Deb and I were living with our then little children in Japan at the time. We spent a number of years there. We sent our kids to Japanese public school. We were living, then living in Malaysia. It was time the time of Japan's industrial ascent. And there was a lot of sort of discourse in the U.S. about how the U.S. had to become more like Japan. <laughs> the title of my book was More Like Us. Yeah. The, the way the sort of the answer for the U.S. was to become to embrace more of the American 
ideal in its best sense, which was openness, opportunity, fluidity, uh, shaking things up, et cetera, et cetera. And that meritocracy, quote unquote, has its places, but so does radical de uh, democracy of, of finding ways for Ordin as the saying goes, ordinary people to do extraordinary uh, things. And so, so uh, I am very much um, in line with that. The subtitle of that book published in 1989 was Making America Great Again. <laughs> I just note this for the record. Um, <laughs> we, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, I, I will say that there's a there's a journalistic um, analog to what you're saying, and there's a sort of policy analog. The journalistic analog is there is a reason that people in the press sh traveling from DC and New York or wherever should never, ever, ever begin conversations in small town diners or in <laughs> Elks halls or whatever saying, what do you think about the filibuster? What do you think about how's Biden doing, how Trump is doing? Because number one, that puts the discussion in the least interesting realm that people have to talk <laughs> about. And number two, it's putting the reporter from the big city in the position of expert. Mm -hmm. And uh, as opposed to asking people about their lives, their towns, their children, their businesses, that's a, a field where those people are the experts on their lives. And people sound smart when they talk about their own lives. They sound dumb when they talk about Trump, Nancy Pelosi, anything else, they sound cliched, but people are interesting. They're smart, they're sophisticated when they, they talk about their own lives. And so you can draw out the best of them rather than, than the worst. The other analog I'll say, uh, you know, prompted by your, by your question is that the part of the American educational establishment I am now most passionate about is community colleges. Mm -hmm. They are the institutions of this moment of connecting the opportunities that actually do abound right now with people who need those opportunities. And that they are they sort of distill the American um, dream of this time of having people have new starts, new possibilities, inventiveness, et cetera. Um, I have a personal disclosure, which I should or should not make now you you can say but i'll, I'll say that i'm prompted by your your question to talk about you know more like us and talk about how you should interview people when you're out on the road and then also why community colleges matter and i also have a point about noam chomsky would you like to hear that point <laughs> yes of course <laughs> so noam chomsky when my wife deb was uh, studying linguistics as an undergraduate and then in graduate school noam chomsky was mr linguistics and so she was sort of in his his force field noam chomsky has had many trails since then i didn't realize that he's a sports talk radio fan and he listens to sports either. talk radio all the time and one of the he wrote an article a couple of years ago saying you learn from sports talk radio that people are smart <laughs> that you, they can say, well, you know, the, the nickel package here, blah, blah, blah. And so if you engage people, there's all this smartness around the country that never comes across if you ask them, what about Trump? What about Biden? What about Kamala Harris? So finding ways to show the smartness of people is part of what uh, a journalist or academics uh, task is. Wonderful. I'm afraid I missed what was the, what, what was the disclosure. <laughs> Oh, the personal disclosure. So this is you can uh, now beginning the the cuttings or not. So okay, uh, you know the the editing. So uh, I grew up in small town Southern California, in a city that Joan Didion famously mocked in her very <laughs> first famous article, "Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream." And so I have a sense of is being that the one from with Joan of, Baez. Uh, no, no. Well, Joan Baez actually went to high school briefly in Redlands High School <laughs> okay. in the town I'm, I'm from. I'm sorry. So, so, so Joan Baez, her father taught briefly at the University of Redlands. So she went to Redlands High School. She was enough ahead of me that I didn't know her. But so and Joan Didion ridiculed the town of Redlands, <laughs> where I grew up, as sort of this this oaky trailer park, um, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like if Ozark was being filmed now, it would be filmed <laughs> in my hometown. Um, then the disclosure is I also unexpectedly went to Harvard as an undergraduate <laughs> and then went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. So I have, there There are different parts of the American experience that I know. I was you know, one of the few members of my high school class to go east of the Mississippi and, and I ended up going to Oxford. And so I have seen 
that part of American life, which I don't usually advertise because it is um, for all the reasons you you know. So I, I grew up in Ozark, comma, California, and have seen these other institutions, but I am now a tribune of the community colleges as the saviors of our country. So there. I guess I had never gone back. I mean, look, I've gone back, I guess, to your childhood in, in things you had written and in the movie, but I'd never uh, gone back far enough to see, to see you uh, in your in your meritocratic glory. Although I will say the, the the meritocracy as we know it now had not gotten going in the in the same way as when as when you were there. My, my <laughs> dissertation director John McGowan he went to uh, Georgetown. But he went to Georgetown before it was the Georgetown as we as we know it now. And even Harvard was nothing like Harvard as as I grew up knowing Harvard as the place where you were, you know, if you didn't go to an Ivy League, you weren't anybody. It, it was a different game back then. But I'm not absolving you, Jim. I still well, well, very well it, it, it's I should say that that when I went there in the late 1960s, you know, I was there was a little coven of us from public schools in California. And there were like 40 graduates of Exeter in the class and of St. <laughs> Paul's and all the rest. So it was, it was, was, was a, a different, different kind of place. And so, and, and then that, that's when um, the still college admissions were more, my parents didn't even know where I was applying to college. Mm. I applied to have, you know, three or four colleges. I, I applied to the Naval Academy and to Berkeley and to MIT and to Harvard. And so, and I think that was it. My parents didn't even know. And it wasn't the nationalized. The very fact that it was a prep school pool still meant that it wasn't this kind of national, international piranha tank the college yeah. admissions have since become. Again, for those of you who don't know the history of these places, the Ivy League, obviously they, they started off mostly as uh, religious institutions, but what they became in the 19th and into the 20th century um, was uh, finishing schools for, for, for upper class young men. Um, and it sounds like when you went there, Jim, it was uh, it was still serving that role to a, to a certain extent. And it's really the eighties and nineties um, with U S news and world reports and all these things that the, the system that we know of now exists. Oh, I see your smile. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, do you know that I was the editor of U S news, US news and world report? Um, I did, but I didn't think you were involved in the college ranking. Was I, 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 was... I was involved in the Augean stables labor of trying to clean them up. Okay. And I that is part that. of the reason that's part of the reason that my tenure at U.S. News came to a sudden end, <laughs> because they are so corrupt and so destructive. And the only answer to them now is to have a zillion uh, competitive rankings. So it's not like the only way. And so if you'd like to, um, this is a don't get me started category. If you'd like to know why these rankings are bad, I can tell you, but I don't need to. Let's look. I want to hear that, but we'll, let's do that another time um, oh, because because I want to talk about leaf blowers. Um, <laughs> because I want to talk about the way that our democracy works, and you are here not just Jim as someone who has uh, looked around and seen democracy working in a bunch of communities, but as someone who made democracy work or or participated in making democracy work in in communities. So tell t tell us about your anti leaf blower efforts. So none of us knows the mark he or she will leave on the world. Mine will probably boil down to tipping the 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 balance against leaf blowers of having people recognize that these are the second hand smoke of our era. They're like, you know, you look back at, at magazine ads from the 1920s saying, get your Coca-Cola now with cocaine <laughs> or the way that my children look at pictures of me in a car from the uh, late fifties or early sixties when there were no seat belts and the, the drivers were holding a beer as they drove and there were no car seats or things like that. People will not believe that these leaf blower de devices ever were legally in use because number one, they are so grotesquely polluting that using one of them for half an hour, a gas powered one is like driving a pickup truck for 5,000 miles. They are so destructive to the lawn crews that um, that I, we, we a famous audiologist said, whenever he sees a leaf blower in use, he thinks of the 
often hired, often immigrant, often mm-hmm. low wage crew saying 10 years from now, they're all going to be deaf. Mm-hmm. And who's going to be taking care of them uh, then? And they're so unnecessary because there are battery alternatives and all the rest. So starting about seven or eight years ago, my wife, Deb, and I began working with some friends in D.C., which readers note, listeners note, is a very diverse community, Washington, mm-hmm. D.C. It is um, economically, it pays more federal tax per capita than any other uh, jurisdiction, but it also has very poor people. It's racially divided, racially diverse, uh, diversified neighborhoods. And so we, over a number of years, got neighborhood groups all across the eight wards of D.C., which are from Georgetown to Anacostia and and all, all the rest. We got them all to recognize the district should control the needless use of these very damaging pieces of equipment for the good of neighborhoods, for the good of lawn crews, for the good of the butterflies and moths that can't propagate if the leaves are blasted out at 200 miles an hour. So three and a half years ago, we got the DC City Council to agree unanimously to a, a shift out, shift from gas-powered leaf blowers to um, battery-powered ones. Uh, we got the D.C. city government to agree on subsidies for this change, we, et cetera, et cetera. So as of January 1st, 2022, uh, the sale or use of gas powered leaf blowers in the District of Columbia, our nation's capital, is now forbidden. And I will say, as you and I talk in late January, I have not heard one in a number of weeks. And yes, it's January, but in all previous Januaries, they've been a wall-to-wall feature. So this was a um, a civically uh, driven initiative that I, I think will be uh, an example for many other communities around the country. Yeah. So there. So there you have it. Right. This is uh, this this is what I'm talking about. And. Uh, uh, Leaving aside all the other things, just to start with the pollution, as I talk to people, I mentioned this to you, they tell me that we need big government, we need centralization, uh, because otherwise we can't do things like fight climate change. First of all, <laughs> in terms of the dysfunction, uh, I don't see the big government going to do something to fight climate change anytime soon. In fact, it seems much more likely the big government is going to prevent communities from from doing things like that. I can imagine more likely the Supreme Court ruling that uh, leaf blower bans are unconstitutional. I can imagine that much more likely than a president signing a bill doing national leaf blower bans. Doesn't that, doesn't that seem right to you, Jim? So, so on the general point, I, I agree that the local is a point of leverage. On the very specific point, we have been thinking for five years about that prospect <laughs> of whether this ban would survive legal challenge. And it is bulletproof because we, we, we constructed it in awareness of the, all the oddities of the Clean Air Act, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd have to have an even more corrupt Supreme Court than one can imagine <laughs> to be able to, 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 to go against this. And I think if the question is, you know, the, the old mantra uh, cliche and yet true of think globally and then acting locally, mm-hmm. uh, that whatever one can do and the local level to plant a tree or protect a watershed or, or shift one's lawn care practices, those have cumulative effect. And I think it may be somebody has calculated that the easiest thing an individual person can do on the climate front is either to plant a tree or not use a goddamn gas-powered leaf blower. Those are the yeah. two things with greatest <laughs> leverage. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. I mean, this seems this seems absolutely right to me. And then I will also say the fact that you had to expend—I don't know how much time and energy to make your local leaf blower bill immune to uh, the (laughs) law courts just suggests to me another way in which we are expending all sorts of energy on this political process that we could be putting into fixing the actual challenges that we face. Uh, Yes, this goes in the category of our fallen world to me. Mm, Yeah. I also, you know, one of the things I um, I quote all the time, uh, Jim, is whenever I see a leaf blower, I say, uh, did uh, did your doctor tell you perhaps you are getting too much exercise, which is a line that <laughs> a line that you wrote, um, because, you know, leaf, I remember raking, I remember raking fondly with my parents talk about, you know, this 
idyllic American life. And, and I rake um, with my, with my children. It's, it's delightful. Raking is wonderful. Now you've got these giant institutions that have to pay people. Yes, probably um, they're hiring contractors who are hiring illegal immigrants or definitely low paid people and destroying their health, not to mention their environment to leaf blow these you know, enormous grounds and that sort of thing. But one, they can just um, buy a battery powered option. And two, they could just change their lawn care to let the leaves fall and provide the kind of environment we need um, to have the butterflies and the bees that we need to eat the food that we need. Otherwise we are, we are all going to die. And this is the think globally, act locally thing. Colleges, get rid of your green lawns and turn them into something wonderful. And you know what? The students will do it for you and they'll do it for you for free colleges if you give them a chance to. But instead the colleges make these green lawns and then they put signs up that say, students are not allowed to be on this lawn, which is again, this, this counterproductive thing that comes from this misunderstanding of how we can actually have the spaces we want. Now I'm just rambling, sorry. But you're rambling in in a way I'm t- I entirely support. So colleges and universities, yes, do what this man says. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll say on, on the rhetorical front, I agree with everything you've said. I love raking. I love making big piles of leaves, our kids <laughs> doing it, et cetera. Rhetorically, um, my, my approach is I'm talking you know, all about pollution, environmental justice, et cetera, on the one hand, and also about butterflies, moths, wildlife, uh, fireflies, where you destroy their habitat, etc. I talk less about the virtues of raking, even though I embrace that, because then that gets you classified as a kook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I talk about pollution, public health. I talk about, you know, wildlife preserving their habitat. Raking, I believe in, but I don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you that was definitely in the Atlantic where you where you spoke positively yes. about raking Jim, but maybe, it's true. Maybe it's been maybe it's been a while. Um, <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had another point, but it just uh, but it's it been just, driven by the word "kook" out of your mind. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'm I'm afraid so. Wait, I have some notes. Let me see if it was in one of those. Things. Oh yes. Um, so I've got another one. This is this is this is what makes me a kook. This is a pet theory. If you if 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 you don't mind, um, do you do you mind hearing my my crazy theory? I, I'm, uh, please bring it on. I would happily um, never speak about global warming ever again. Um, the lowest number I've ever seen for number of people killed every year by air pollution is two million people. The higher numbers are three to four million people globally. It could be, there's new research that it's even higher than that. So let me outline these two scenarios for you. Scenario one is you get a bunch of celebrities together and make a movie and release it on Netflix and get 10 of the most left-wing members of the Senate to co-sponsor a bill to do something, I don't know, whatever sweeping Green New Deal thing people want to solve the problem of global warming, which I'm all for doing all that stuff, but it seems to me that that's just gonna run straight into all of the dysfunction. And then you're going to drive people uh, in the red camp on the other side to being pro-global warming as, as we have done. Or you can just say, you know, more people die every year. More people die every year from air pollution then died from COVID in the worst year of COVID and say, so why don't you go to your town council and see what you can do about leaf blowers or that coal fired power plant. And I can imagine in towns all over the country, if not the world, people getting together to fight air pollution. Now, don't tell anyone. (laughs) <laughs> this will also solve the global warming problem. But right now, as near as I can tell, there is not a partisan desi- uh, divide on whether it's good that your grandmother should die of emphysema. That there is a, and, and if you move the conversation that way and move it to the local level, it seems to me that we could solve the global warming crisis without ever mentioning global warming because everyone wants to breathe clean air. And global warming has rightly or wrongly become associated with 
left-wing technocratic globalist, whatever Joe Rogan style uh, QAnon theorizing you want. But people want their grandmother to, to breathe clean air. So why don't we just have that conversation? So um, I'm all in favor of, so, so number one, I agree. Number two, I would say address rather than solve global warming, mm-hmm. or at least yes. it would be in, of, the, in, in the right direction. Number three, there's always a foreign menace <laughs> angle here <laughs> that you can use. So w- when we were living in China, it was when the the U.S. embassy in Beijing first began uh, monitoring PM 2.5 levels for the very smallest particulates, which are the most damaging mm-hmm. to you. And there was great... Um, um, sort of schadenfreude in the U.S. then of seeing in the U.S. on a bad pollution day, you might have a like a reading of 80 or 100 p.m. 2.5 in Southern California. And in Beijing in those times, it would be like 2,000. Mm-hmm. And we were all, you know, just sort of choking to death in Beijing. And the Chinese government used that as a lever to try to clean things up because they were dying so grotesquely in mm-hmm. such huge numbers from, from air pollution. The U.S. is now edging up in the PM 2.5 bad readings. And I think there are ways in which you could say, well, you know, the the Chinese have found a way to deal with (laughs) this. We could, too. And so, yes, air pollution is killing your grandmother. It's killing your children. It's killing you. We have these measures. Are we going to let the Chinese show us up? I'm generally against using the Chinese as a menace, but this is a, because I, you know, we should do these things for our own reasons, but you can, if you want to have a Chinese menace, that's how you do it. Oh, beautiful. Um, okay, Jim, I could happily talk to you for another hour, but uh, I'm, I'm going to move us towards the end. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll just take that hour out of your time, maybe in the second half <laughs> of 2022 or something like that. We can talk rankings. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that would be uh, that would be a delightful uh, conversation. I don't know, maybe maybe Bill Derusowicz would join us. That just seems like that would yeah. be. <laughs> oh, man. Um but I want, I want to ask you, I mean, I've outlined a, a few ways, but what can we, you know, so first of all, I need to say that you said you accept the label everyday anarchism. So I'm going to, you know, edit your uh, Wikipedia page. Um, J- James Fowler's <laughs> comma, Jimmy Carter, screenwriter and uh, scriptwriter and everyday anarchist. <laughs> yes. Comma. Um, what, what can we do as we, I mean, we know what we can do about the dysfunction. You lay that out in the Derek Thompson interview and I myself am not, certain that's going to break in any time soon. If you're waiting for the Republican fever to break, as I think Obama said more than 10 years ago, keep waiting. What can we or should we do day to day to to make a difference? I I guess at the national level, it would be so disclosure, of course, I don't really know. (laughs) These are just my 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 my, uh, coming trying to come up with an answer. At a national level, it would be somehow being steeled to not turn into disengagement by all the things that are discouraging, that it still is all the more important to to vote and to Mm -hmm. register to vote and to uh, ask people questions and to support news media that are doing good things, et cetera. So I think the national level would be finding ways to remain engaged even at this very troubling time because the greatest defeat and the worst propulsion for things that are are, uh, most damaging at the national level would be if people just just disengage and think it is too dark. I'm not going to pay attention. But then at the local level where you can make a difference by running for office or supporting people who run for office or finding ways to think uh, what will attract people to this community, what will address the problems of this community, what will another tree do here, what will another park do here. Um, I've been very one of the things that Deb and I are now doing with our new little foundation called the, uh, if you look at um, our town's foundation dot, um, you know, dot org, you'll, you'll see our site is finding ways to connect people with constructive ideas around the community. As you and you and I talk, uh, Graham, in, in late January, we're about, you know, early, uh, later this spring to launch a new initiative with many more events and podcasts and connections. But it's essentially to have people around the country who are part of a movement and don't realize it to feel some common purpose and say, what's happened in Pensacola in terms of racial racial reconciliation actually might be useful in San Bernardino or Compton 
or in Detroit or other places, and what's happened in across Iowa in terms of community sort of um, uh, sustainability might be also of use in North Carolina, or it might be of, of use in Utah or other places. So I, I think there are lots of ways to, to get traction at the local uh, level and looking for those and doing them. One, one further point, um, California, my home state, the most populous state, of course, has a, a volunteer corps that's intentionally modeled on the old Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s, the national level. And its idea is to say at every level of possible engagement, if we have a year to give, if you have a week to give, if you have an hour to give, if you have a walk downtown, what could you do with that time? And creating some checklist of what you can do if you're just walking to the downtown, or if you have uh, some young person who could give a year of actual volunteerism and, and be rewarded for it. So I think um, engaging, remaining committed uh, nationally, but actually looking for the engagement locally. I think that is that is the source of um, hope that I would propose. Okay, that sounds good. The only thing I would say is in terms of engaging nationally, I, I beg of you people, don't, don't spend that time reading Politico about something that happened in a subcommittee <laughs> hearing. I know like that's one version of engagement is being on political Twitter constantly know what's going on, inform yourself about the issues, vote. One of the very first questions I got can, can, was, can anarchists vote? Um, and my answer was, was, was yeah, certainly everyday anarchists. Yes, can, and they should. <laughs> yes, can and should vote. But don't get sucked into politics as team sport. And honestly, at that point, it becomes a spectator sport where you want your team to win. But when you get down to that level of minutia, it's nothing that you can affect in, in any possible way. Stick to the stuff that you can, in fact, with voting or lobbying or talking to your congressman, actually congressperson, that you could actually connect with in some way. I entirely agree there. And even worse than reading the story about the subcommittee is reading the story about, oh, Prospects look grim in midterms <laughs> with the latest, you know, uh, poll, which is either crazy, you know, that that's that that is the worst kind of team sports. That's like Las Vegas. How does the line change on the Super Bowl without the interestingness of the Super Bowl? You're no, you're no longer even <laughs> looking at the sport. You are looking at other people's predictions about the sport. Yeah, yes. that sounds. That sounds great. Um, or that sounds terrible. So I think that sounds like great <laughs> advice not to be doing that. Um, okay, Jim, thank you so much. This has been such a such a pleasure. I too have enjoyed our correspondence um, over the years and appreciate your work and above all, appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Graham, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to talking with you again. All right. Sounds wonderful. So there you have it. That was my interview with James Fallows. It was a true joy to record. I hope it was a joy to listen to. As I said, I'll have some links to uh, his work and his website for Our Towns um, in the show notes. Um, remember that this is an entirely listener-supported show. Everyday Anarchism has no sponsors, no grants, no institution, no advertisements, no paywall. For me to keep making this show, I do need your financial help. If you can, please go to everydayanarchism.com and make a financial donation. If you can't give, you can leave a rating for the show at Apple Podcasts or now Spotify. Tell a friend, do anything else to get the word out and help the show thrive. All that's left to say is that the music, which you're about to hear, is by David Hill.